you'll find at the tables um, a couple of survey forms and some pencils. If you can take a couple of minutes to fill that out, it's very short. I'm going to use the information from that next week. So you'll be helping me out to do that. So um, if you didn't get a chance to do that last week, take a couple of minutes to do it now. Now, for those of you who weren't able to join us last week, let me just catch you up on what we talked about. So last week, we did a, a rather accelerated um, <laughs> review of all the solutions that we have available today to avert catastrophic levels of global warming. And I hope that you took away sort of three um, overall conclusions from that uh, rap rather rapid session. Uh, the first is that we have all the solutions we need today to dramatically reduce the level of greenhouse gas emissions we emit in our economy. And there are more solutions coming and they're getting better all the time. Um, so we can absolutely have a huge impact on this challenge if we put those solutions to work. The second thing I hope you concluded is that these solutions are affordable. It does take some investment, but it's even possible, depending how quickly the technology improves, that we will save money in the process because we'll pay less for electricity. We'll have less expensive expenses on health care related to air pollution. Asthma is just endemic in our country, and it's very affected by the quality of our air. Um, and then finally, there's this one really big cost of uh, the path we're on right now that we didn't talk about last week. Week, and that is the damage associated with extreme fires and floods and uh, droughts. The damage from that it far exceeds the amount of investment that would be required to uh, switch to clean energy, for example. So overall, it's affordable to, to make this big transformation that we need to undertake. And then, you know, finally, I hope uh, you took away that we can actually make this a better place, a better world for future generations if we implement those solutions more quickly. So today we're going to move to talking about how we put those solutions into action. And today um, we have a little more time because we don't have that other event happening at the same time. So we'll have a lot more time for questions and, and discussion. And in fact, today I'm going to ask you to do a lot more of the work <laughs> than, than last week. So. Um, what we're going to talk about today is how we put those solutions into action in the three roles that we all play. I mean, first is our role as household managers. Whether we're a household of one or many, um, we all share uh, a certain amount of, of emissions. We play a part in, in uh, carbon emissions through our consumption of energy and goods and food and services. So we'll talk about the things that we can do that are under our control, personal control, to bring down the impact that we have. The second thing, a role we'll talk about is our role as members of the community, like St. Andrews, where we're in relationship with other people, whether it's in our churches, schools, um, workplaces, uh, hobbies, you know, sports, all the ways that we interact with other people uh, give us an opportunity to come together as community and tackle this challenge. Um, and then the final um, role we'll talk about is our role as citizens, where we may not know the other people very well that we're interacting with, but we have, um, at least in this country, a lot of influence over this uh, process that we may not yet be um, taking advantage of. So we're going to talk about how we can do that as well today. So with that in mind, um, I want to get us underway and talk about first how we can reduce our own household impact. And there's a, an approach actually in whichever of those roles we're talking about that really um, is what we need to implement overall. And that's the process of going carbon neutral. And when I talk about that, I, I'm talking about three steps that we can take um, to reduce our impact. You know, the first is to actually measure our impact, right? Figure it out. I'm a, a big proponent of you know, the fact that what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. So there's a step of measuring our impact, and then there's a step of thinking about ways that we can reduce it, and then finally a step, because in the way our economy is organized, it's not possible for us to reduce or eliminate all of our impacts right now, um, but we can offset it. 
So we're going to talk about each of those um, for a moment here, and then we're going to go into each one of them in a little more detail. So when we measure our impact, there's two kinds of impacts to think about. You know, one is the very direct impact we have when we burn fossil fuels, whether it's for getting around or for heating or cooling our uh, buildings or hot water in the house. Those are the major um, uses. But there's also emissions embodied is the term that the, the, the scientists will use or in, you know, embedded in, within all the goods and services that we produce in our food, in um, you know, household items that we buy, think about anything you get at Costco, Home Depot, um, um, Lowe's and uh, Nordstrom's for example. All those trips involve um, purchases of goods that took a lot of energy to make and in some cases, with some materials, like we talked about last week, with cement, for example, the actual creation of cement releases a lot of carbon dioxide from the chemistry of that process. So um, we need to be thinking about those, both those dimensions. Um, this, on the reducing our impact part, there are a couple of major categories of, of opportunities for us to reduce our impact. The first is in just saving energy. Uh, there are a lot, many ways in which we use energy today that aren't very efficient. And we could um, do a lot and save ourselves money in the process by reducing the amount of energy we use. The other big change that we all need to implement is to switch to clean energy sources. So you know, we probably all burn gas for our cars, and we burn a uh, different kind of gas, methane, for our uh, heating and cooling in buildings. We need to switch off those two fuels and convert those uses to electricity. Um, we talked last week about how in this part of the country we already have a relatively fossil fuel free electrical grid and it is now on a schedule to be completely free of fossil fuels. I think the, you know, the target date is 2045 will be neutral um, because of offset by 2030. I think it might even happen sooner than that. The third category of things, or the second category of things we can do is in our food. Um, there's an awful lot of food that goes wasted, and food does take a lot of energy to create and deliver to our, our table, and it uses, um, for example, when farmers use uh, tr uh, conventional fertilizers, there are greenhouse gas emissions that occur in the form of nitrous oxides. Um, so there are a lot of emission sources in our food supply, um, we can also do things to buy food that is produced more locally and more in season. That tends to have a lower carbon footprint. And then finally, probably the biggest opportunity in the near term for us is to simply eat less meat and less dairy, but in particular beef and pork are uh, very, uh, have a very hard carbon footprint associated with their production the way it's done today. Then finally, is the, the final step in this process is offsetting. So that the concept here is one that takes a little bit of time to pe for people to sort of internalize or, or wrap their head around. Um, I think about it simply as a trade. Um, I have emissions that I've created, and there are other people, and, and I can't do anything about them practically in the near term. There are other people who have opportunities to either avoid emissions or, better yet, to take carbon dioxide out of the air and store it, which is mostly in our natural carbon sinks, that they aren't able to take advantage of because they can't afford it. So I'm simply, um, we're willing to conduct a trade in which I will pay them to do that on my behalf and offset or cancel out the emissions that I personally create. So uh, yeah, this is a good time to take questions about emissions general, or offsets generally. We're going to review them in a little more detail in a moment. Okay. So one of the problems I've heard argued with offsets <clears throat> is that um, some of the people who are who you pay for offsets are realistically they're in the offset market, but they're doing things they would have probably done anyway. So mm -hmm. offsets aren't always necessarily you know, carbon negative or carbon neutral in, in terms of that exchange. How do you consider when you're going to purchase an offset or, you know, like through PSE, I know you can purchase certain offsets for, for certain things. How do you know that you're truly getting an offset there and you're not just like paying somebody who's going to plant trees right. anyway? So the simple answer to your question is I encourage you, encourage you to purchase offsets that have been certified by a third party. And we'll talk about four criteria of which 
um, that is one that you want to look for in offsets. But it's, it's not something that I, that, you know, the analysis, analysis of that isn't necessarily something you have to do yourself. You can rely on parties that are in that role of verifying whether the offsets are going to have the impact we want them to have. So I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Okay. Second question, you might be getting to this shortly. Um, accurately measuring uh, our carbon footprint, how do we do that in a way that can be repeated so you can measure, make a change? Sure. Test, test yeah, and that. we're going to do that right now. Cool. Uh, next. <laughs> so the, the major categories of offsets I think about are the ones that have to do with our natural carbon sinks, whether it's, you know, managing forests in a way that enables them to capture more carbon because if you don't cut trees as often uh, as the primary way or you don't convert that land from a forest to another use that isn't going to capture a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, swamps are another one we don't think about a lot. They, they, they store a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, so these are um, areas that if we maintain them and, and manage them well, they can do a lot more for us to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The second category are, is things that I think about is uh, helping other people uh, by giving them tools that they may not have today. And probably the two most common ones you'll see if you go to purchase offsets and they talk about a project in Africa or South America where they're trying to deliver cook stoves to people in communities where they may be burning uh, burning wood or uh, coal, for example, in enclosed spaces to try and you know, cook, which doesn't do much for their air quality. Um, and it's not a very efficient way to generate the heat they need. So you have cook stoves that run on gas, and then you give them bio, bio gas digesters, little systems that you can put um, effectively compost in and create methane from that and then use it in the cook stove. So there are ways that we can help other people who can't afford it do things that will reduce impact. So that's the sort of general idea. And I want to just emphasize that this is a process. You're going to do it, measure now. We do this now kind of once a year when we do our taxes. We take a brief look at our impact levels. Uh, have we been getting down? What can we do this year to reduce them further? And then we purchase offsets for the rest. So I'll, uh, here's an example of a tool that I, I can recommend. I've done this myself just you know, by, with a spreadsheet and some numbers that I had to go gather. Uh, it was kind of involved exercise, but there are tools online that you can use. And this is just an example of one that uh, you can get. This is from the University of Berkeley, uh, California at Berkeley. Um, there's a group there that maintains this estimator and I'll just say two things about it. One on the left side is sort of a little interview form. They're going to ask you questions about your household size, where you live, activities that you do in your household. And from those, they're going to make estimates of what your um, carbon emissions are. Um, this, on the right side is the actual output, which uh, this is roughly for our house and for our household. And I just want to emphasize a couple of things on here. Um, so there's five categories, travel, home, food, goods, and services. And through the interviewing process, they made estimates for me of each of these. And it came out about the same as the analysis that I did. So I feel like it's probably a reasonable way to do it. Um, and it makes sense to me, because in, in uh, travel, we're much better overall than other households. Because they, have a, you know, they compare this to national averages. Um, we don't live, we don't work, we don't have a commute, we work at home, and we have an electric car. So it makes sense. Our biggest chunk is actually air travel. So that makes sense to me. Uh, the house makes sense to me too. It's about the same, um, you know, slightly worse than average. We have a bigger house, which is probably why. Um, and our biggest uh, item is natural gas, and burning of natural gas to heat and cool our home and water is, is probably the main reason. Um, this, you know, in our area, again, this is going to go to zero over the next uh, decade um, as fossil fuels are eliminated from the use uh, to generate electricity. In food, we're actually doing better. Um, we, you know, pay a fair amount of attention to the diet. Or I should say our household chef uh, does that for me. Um, and we've been kind of gradually reducing our consumption of uh, meat in particular. 
I found lots of really great recipes that are quite tasty, and I just personally don't feel like it's even hardly been an inconvenience. Um, so it's just a habit that we've changed over time that seems to be working. Um, we are worse on goods and services, and that's, I think, simply a function of income. Um, we spend a lot more on, on things that other households don't spend money on. So that's why these two categories are larger. Um, and overall, we're a little bit better than average. So not that really to write home about, but <laughs> we're, um, we're doing what we can and trying to reduce it further over time. So any, any questions about the measurement part? Oh, one last point I want to make, and then I want to take your question, is that you don't have to do this. You can skip it. Um, the average American admission is 20 metric tons. And I don't, do, do we, so last time in the spring we talked about what a metric ton is. It, basically, think of a giant balloon 30 feet in diameter. That's a metric ton of carbon dioxide. Um, so the average American is 20 when you consider both the energy we use and then the goods that we import from other countries that um, generated emissions to be manufactured. In this state, because of our electrical grid, you could probably use 14. That would be an average for um, a Washingtonians. Uh, and again, it's that combination of our energy use in our region plus the imports of goods and services. Um, so your question. <coughs> What is, what is the website that this is on? So if you go to Nori's website, which is where I get my offsets, you'll find a link to it. It's the Cool Climate, cool to Climate Group at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, well, the, the URL, I can, I can go out. I, so I will send everybody a guidebook, a short guide to, to all this stuff with all the resources. So you don't have to try and write down URLs and everything right here. Can you spell um, Nori really? N-O-R-I, and that's a Seattle-based company that's created a carbon removals uh, marketplace um, that I'll talk about more in a moment. Okay, so that's kind of general. So what I want to do next is simply get more specific and make a list. And I'm going to ask you to do that for me. So what, I, what I'm going to do is we're going to, we're going to do this in two categories. Um, on the left side are things you can do in your household that take um, very little uh, time or, or money. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna look at, at you know, little time or money, and then we're gonna want take the ones that take an investment of either time or money. Now I think in almost all cases, you're not gonna do this investment unless it pays off over time, but it does take an upfront expenditure. Um, so, I'm just going to take volunteers. Who's got one they want to throw out? For a little time, certainly changing the light bulbs. Okay. An energy efficient light bulbs takes a little time for money. <coughs> Turn down the thermostat. Thermostat? Mm -hmm. I'm the back. Cold water wash. Cold water wash. The cold water wash. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Composting your food waste. Composting food waste. Mm -hmm. Take your own cloth bags to the grocery store. Okay. Just turn off the lights or turn off the TV or turn off appliances when they're not in use. Okay, let's just call those, that's managing electrical loads. Bring home less plastic. I'm sorry, what? Bring home less plastic. Less plastic. <laughs> Anything else that comes to mind? In the summertime, um, I have gallon jugs that I collect water in when I'm heating it to wash, wash my face or whatever, uh, or to heat it before the dishwasher is turned on. And then I use that to water all my deck plants. Um, well, I, I call that gray water. <laughs> yes. And so we can use gray water in landscaping, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's move to things that we know do cost money. 
to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, replace your regular toilets with the water saving toilets. Mm -hmm. uh, flash toilets. Mm -hmm. Better windows. Windows. Mm -hmm. An electric car. Electric car. And furnace and water heater and all of those things. Appliances too. So furnace. Talking about switching to electricity. Yeah. Just, oops. Oh, and uh, same with the water heater. Solar panels. Mm -hmm. Solar panels. <clears throat> Insulation. Insulation. Thank you. Energy efficient uh, appliances. Appliances. Okay, these are all great. And what I want to do now is simply compare them to a list of things that I've learned are um, high impact that fit into both these categories. And we'll just kind of see how we did at checking things off. OK. Well, not so many of those are <laughs> here yeah. on the left side. Yeah. Um, so. Kind of, and it's, I would work this sort of from the bottom up. We didn't get one of them. Uh, that's on my list. Yeah. Uh, right here, thermostat. Yeah. Um, all right, so, yeah, so managing your thermostat, I mean, this is you probably, I don't know, you can, this is just personal preference, but we've, over time, I think when the kids were growing up, it was probably 72 that we were using, and now it's 68. And, you know, if we feel a little bit chilled, we wear a sweater. So. That seems to work well for us, and it probably does for others as well. Um, and of course, the reverse is true too. In the summer, if you have cooling, um, the less you use that, the, the so some people. I've been in some buildings where I'm cold. I mean, I don't know about you, but I go into certain grocery stores and I'm freezing because they don't cover the fronts of any of the place of refrigerated places, with the exception maybe of ice cream. Um, so much waste in it. So there are some examples of that around us that are bad. Um, we didn't catch many of these, right? So these are the big ones that don't take any time or money necessarily to implement. I'm not saying that they'll all be ones that you could implement. It depends on your situation. But um, eco-driving is, is the one I, I toss out, which really has a couple of things. One is keeping your tires properly inflated, keeping a car really tuned up, and then trying to stay off the brakes which, you know, if you can play a little game, just get to play a game and say, how little can I use the brake today? It involves thinking ahead and not, you know, accelerating out to a stoplight and <coughs> slamming on the brakes every time you use the brakes. That's just wasted energy. Um, and that can make a difference of like 10%, potentially, depending uh, on the car in your mileage. Buying less stuff is, frankly, one of the biggest ones. And we are, I mean, we all do this to some degree. And I'm as guilty as anyone I noticed the other day I have five shovels in our garden. <laughs> How did I get five shovels? <laughs> if I have a work party, I can borrow from a neighbor. I mean, I really didn't need five shovels. Um, and every one of those was probably made in China from coal-fired energy, um, and it's metal. And it, so it's just, you know, all of those have an impact. Um, anything that has a lot of mass. So you think the bigger it is, the more you should be thinking about, do I really need that? Um, buying local and in season is another one. If you compare, for example, getting blueberries in December from Argentina versus getting them in August in the, you know, where they could even be local, uh, right down the street, there's a huge difference in the amount of, of uh, energy and emissions associated with getting that to your plate. Um, eating less meat is a big one. Driving less and flying less are the, by far the probably the two biggest ones that you can just, it doesn't take time to do that, and it can save you a lot. Um, now let's go to the other column. I actually have the light bulbs over here because there is an investment, um, but uh, it is you know kind of at the top of my list because it's one of the lowest cost, highest impact things you can do. 
And uh, we haven't been really great at our house. We still have some halogen bulbs around, not the incandescent ones, but we still have some halogen. But these days, it just makes sense to just replace them all. Uh, even if they're still working, just replace them. Um, switching to electric vehicle is absolutely high. Thank you for insulation. Um, most homes, in the, many homes in this area, I don't, I don't know if it's most anymore, were built before we had a concept of an energy coat. And many of those homes didn't have a lot of insulation. Not a lot of tension, not a lot of tension was paid to making them efficient. We have a mild climate and our electricity is cheap. So um, those homes could be a lot more efficient than they are, potentially 30 to 50 percent. If you did the full treatment of sealing and insulating them, you know, putting in occupancy controls um, that help you keep the energy use down. We did talk about switching to uh, heat pump technology and replacing very old furnace uh, appliances. It's not usually going to work out to replace a relatively new appliance uh, just because there's a lot of energy that goes into making that, that uh, appliance. I put uh, another one up here that takes some investment. It may require that you have more property. It's not necessarily a lot of time, but you have to have space, and that's planning treats. So, uh, so anyways, this was kind of my greatest hits list, if you will, of the things you can do to reduce your household impact. Um, and most of these things are going to show up in a calculator like that. There's even a part of that other calculator I showed you a moment ago, where towards the end, where they'll make a list of the things you could do, and they'll try, and this is kind of hard, but they'll try to give you a sense for the impact they have. You know, I know in the, in the Southwest and the South, um, even you can wash it in solar panels, you know, work pretty well because you have a lot of sun. Mm -hmm. I've, heard it, I've heard that they actually are not too bad here in Seattle. Do you have a sense for that as far as how worth the investment it is as far as? It, would, it didn't make my list because it would be more efficient if utilities did that or if you did it at a community scale. It just happens that when you, you know, get it down to a household scale here, um, because we have less solar energy than other places, it doesn't pencil out as well. Um, it would make more sense to get your utility to stop using um, natural gas and, uh, um, and coal. Well, and I know somebody in our neighborhood recently put solar panels in and they took out like six giant evergreen trees so that their, so their roof could get sun. So all of a sudden, like, the whole house is exposed so they get sun and all the trees are gone. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not the best. I mean, it's probably, it's becoming better all the time uh, because, like I said, the panels are becoming more and more efficient. But it's not the best in this area. Not the most important thing. In this area, in this state, the biggest um, impact we could have is on transportation. So driving less, flying less, using an EV in particular is really good here. Um, you know, it's not as good if the grid is mostly fired by coal or natural gas like it is in some Midwest states, but that's changing too. Anyway, that's kind of the greatest hits list, and you'll, you know, if you use a calculator like that, you'll get exposed to all these things. They will suggest them as things you can do. So I wanted to have Kurt talk for a minute about what he's done here to reduce the emissions associated with the facilities here. And uh, this is uh, emissions, not, uh, it's been converted from looking at your, your gas use and your electricity use. So, Kurt. Well, I'll project. Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, Jeff asked me to reduce, uh, to, to come up with the numbers of what we've been doing here at St. Andrews over the last couple of years. And as you see the general uh, trend of the graph, I'm pretty happy with it, 31% reduction in emissions, as he points out. So how, how much of that is because of the grid? You know, what's the, what's the grid? Very, very little of that. Oh, really? Because the big change, because in this area, you're on Puget Sound Energy, and the emissions intensity factors for Puget Sound Energy have not changed a lot. They changed a little bit over this time frame. Uh, they're going to change significantly going forward. If you were in Seattle, the um, bottom part of this would be um, virtually zero. Because the whole, uh, their source of uh, electric fuel for electricity is almost entirely hydropower. 
So in 2014 uh, is when we started kind of looking at this with some uh, seriousness and, and doing some things about it. And in that year, you may have noticed these lights here, these are LEDs now. These used to be 90 and 120 watt uh, incandescent bulbs and now they're 18 watt LEDs. And so we replaced all these in here in the fellowship hall and in the music room. Uh, the big thing we did, there's these same floodlights around the exterior of the building for lighting at night. And because of those, uh, the, the number of hours that those are on, those are on average of 14 hours a day, average throughout the year. So 12 hours of darkness and then we, hit, we run them a little bit up past sunset and uh, before sunset and after sunrise on that. So that was the huge drop and you see from 13 to 14 there's a, a big drop there. Uh, we did that in Ability Pew Sound Energy has grants for businesses as well as for your homes can help out with these things. Um, so they paid a portion of these light bulbs. Uh, also things like if you notice the exit sign in back above the door so things like that, that's on 24-7 all the time, and that is now 8 watts of LED. It used to be 50 watts of incandescent light bulbs, and there we replaced five of those in the building. So things like that really add up. Um, we also, uh, the uh, HVAC we talked about, um, I have been over time kind of really squeezing the amount of hours we use and setting the thermostats to uh, a low-ish temperature. So they're set around 67, figuring if people go into the room and you're too cold, turn it up. But then it'll, it stays at 67 as a baseline. But also really looking at squeezing the hours of when is that room being used. And throughout this whole building, there are 14 different heating zones. This room is one, that room is one, the narthex is its own, the music room is its own. So there's all of these and really looking at when are people in those rooms and really squeezing the hours for those. Uh, also, some of our hot water tanks, um, I, the, some of the smaller ones are electric. They were already electric and so I put uh, switches on those, computer controlled switches. So at night they just go off. And that's technology you can do at home too. I have, a, I have a, a mechanical timer on mine, so it goes off at 10 o'clock at night. No one's taking showers, we're not running the dishwasher anymore at 10 o'clock at night, it comes back on in the morning. So they're savings even on a conventional uh, electric hot water tank that you can do. Um, get some more lights. And then uh, last year, uh, there are seven light bulbs that light our parking lot. Some of those were a thousand watt electric light bulbs. And, and again, they're on 14 hours a day, you know, spread throughout the year. So replace those to, uh, I think the new ones, they're like 115 watts. So like the equivalent of like an old 100 watt light bulb of what the amount of light those put out. And so there's seven of those out there that we did. And then this uh, last year, we also replaced the sanctuary from a gas furnace to the electric heat pump technology you talked about. So that's kind of what we have done in recent. Um, I don't have any immediate plans to do any more things. Uh, as I said, some of the things I, I have looked at are, um, they take some investment and doing, and so that takes some upfront money. Puget Sound Energy uh, said we'll do grants and things, but it still takes some upfront cost on uh, your part. Um, there are things like the, the sanctuary light bulbs. There's 36 of them and they're 300 watts each. So that's a lot of electricity. And when the sanctuary lights go on, I can see the meter starts spinning. <laughs> it starts going fast. But that room is only used about 10 hours a week. So we're four hours on a Sunday morning and an occasional hour here and there. So you have to weigh the use with the, the payback as well. So Thank you, Kurt. I wanted to, to just emphasize two things about this. One is that this has saved you guys a lot of money. 
because I looked at the um, uh, energy intensity of your facility and compared it to our home church on Mercer Island and noted that if they've been as efficient per square foot of, of energy of, you know, had the same amount of energy per foot as St. Andrews, they'd say $18,000 a year. So it's a bigger facility, quite a bit bigger, but still. Yeah. And can you give us an estimate how much 31% saves a year? In cost. Yeah, the electrical stuff. You, can add, you can do that number. You, I can. I, I can't off the top of my head, and I yeah. hate to give you a bad number. But it's on the order of several thousand dollars per year. Yeah. Our, our electric yeah. bill, I think, when I started, was around $16,000 a year, and it's it's down to ten or eleven now. So. Well done. I Thank thought we'd see a bigger impact when we changed out that old furnace. So the furnace only changed out in October. It started in October, so it's really hard to tell. Uh, yeah. So Kurt, I made an attempt to guess he as to what that would do next year. So it, the <coughs> furnace is showing up. Yeah. He did what 2020, he, he it, guessed on 2020 numbers. It, it's showing here in two ways. One is that there's less um, emissions associated with burning gas, because you're burning less gas, <coughs> but you're also using a little more electricity. So there is a bit of an offset there, but remember, this is going to zero over the next 10 years, roughly. And um, without you changing anything here. Yeah. So as you switch to using electricity, this is just going to go down um, without your involvement. Because of what the energy company is going to do. Here. Yeah, so by law now, Puget Sound Energy is required to eliminate fossil fuel from their sources of electrical generation over on a schedule. Many of the you know, municipal utilities and other utilities in the state already have almost no use of fossil fuel, mostly because they're hydro-based. Uh, um, but Puget Sound Energy is not one of those. Their mix today is still 60% coal and natural gas. Okay, so that's gonna change. Dave, you had a question? No, I was just wondering, as people and businesses convert from natural gas to electricity is Puget Sound Energy equipped to take the increased electrical load and still be able to uh, reduce the uh, carbon emissions? Well, in the process of doing this, so this is kind of the big question that everybody's got. Mm -hmm. as we, Repeat the question. So the question is, what will happen? Uh, is Puget Sound Energy prepared to, to make this transition? And the answer is, I think, Maybe. <laughs> the, uh, this, is, this is a problem, um, a it's not a problem, it's a challenge. It's just a technical challenge to, for these kinds of organizations to manage the transition from using more fossil fuels to generate electricity using renewable sources of energy. And there's a whole bunch of changes that need to occur uh, because frankly, you know, at some point in the next 10 years, there'll be so many vehicles running around that are little batteries little batteries running around everywhere. And if we could figure out how to use those batteries to even things out on the grid, well, that'd be great. They're working on doing that in places like San Diego, where they're a little more ahead of the curve. We're not there yet. Um, that's, that's the challenge, and that's why this transition is going to take time and effort. I want to keep us on schedule. So thank you very much, Kurt. Definitely heading in the right direction. And I want to talk briefly about offsets now. So this gets to the question you had a moment ago. So, um, I mentioned, and I'll just talk about the particular way we've done this in our house, because it's changed over time, but just this year, I'll, I'll use one example. So when you go to purchase an offset, you're looking for four things out of that offset. First of all, you want to know what really happened. <laughs> the action you're paying someone to do, you want to make sure it actually got done. Um, the second is you want it to be permanent. You know, you know, if you do something like it, for example, in my case, we pay the farmer to change his practices in a way that store more carbon in the soil. They could undo that by reverting to the old way of doing things. You'd like that change to be permanent. The, um, you want that change to be additional. That was the question that was raised earlier. Would, they, would this have happened anyways? It's been, you know, did I pay for something that should have happened, was going to happen anyways? That's probably the hardest question to answer uh, across the board, but uh, that's another thing you're looking for. And then finally, no leakage. If you pay someone to do something, you don't want them to turn around like a forester to um, not harvest or thin a certain area. If they turn around and clear cut another area instead, 
um, and, and you need to pay them in that, they do it over here. It doesn't, doesn't work out. And that's happened in places in the Amazon, for example. Um, so the, the thing that you, so big companies have um, resources to analyze. It's like Microsoft has teams of people who um, figure out what are the best offsets for Microsoft to invest in. You don't have those kind of resources, but that's okay, because you have two things that you can rely on. First, you can rely on retailers like Carapass and Cool Effect and Climate Action Reserve that will, they put together programs and they effectively sell shares in them. Um, and you can rely on certifications. So there are other third-party organizations that verify whether these programs are doing what they are supposed to do, and those include things like Gold Standard, Green E, and uh, American Carbon Registry. So more and more, this is becoming um, something that you can depend on and, and use to good effect. Um, it wasn't necessarily the case. There have been outright, 10 years ago, there was an example of outright fraud, for example, that, that um, were eventually uncovered, but they took a while. Um, so any, any other questions about offsets? I mean, the process of doing this is quite simple. Once you've measured, it sits it like online shopping. You just go and you make an order, and that's it. That's all there to it. We spent last year about $450 or $500 to offset our emissions. OK. Um, now, this we're going to get to the, the bulk of the work today for you guys. Um, we're going to talk about what communities can do for a moment. And I just want to focus in on one type of community and two examples. And then we're going to, um, at our tables, talk about what St. Andrew's community can do to respond to the global climate crisis. So the community on the left is uh, United Church of Christ, Mercer Island. And the one on the right is St. Mark's in Seattle. Very different. One's quite small, the other's quite large. Um, and on the left, um, the pastor, uh, Rominger, uh, Robita, Rom Roberta Rominger, um, has been very concerned about the impact of human activity on God's creation for some time and decided to make it a real emphasis uh, at the church. He did a, a sermon series about it, and a number of people stepped forward to form a climate action team. And they took uh, a look inward first and looked at their facilities and what they could do and started, they invested in solar, made sense for them. Um, they looked at ceiling and insulation as well and that work is ongoing. They also looked at just the operations of the church. Were they recycling in ways that made sense? Um, were they composting? They started doing that, they hadn't been. Um, they started serving more meatless meals um, when they had meals at the church. So they just, took a look inward and did an inventory and figured out what they had control over. Um, then they turned outward to the congregation and started hosting um, various sorts of forums, uh, kind of like this one. Um, and, um, but they had this kind of as an ongoing kind of series. And then, and this is quite, I think, it's kind of out of their comfort zone, right? So, uh, and it's out of their comfort zone for many churches. They got engaged in the, as citizens. Um, they started writing letters to Washington legislators, asking them to, to do things to reduce, um, the, reduce global warming. They supported the Environmental Voters Project. And they got together and went down to and participated in the, uh, the Washington Environmental Council Lobby Day, which was held once a year during the session. Uh, focuses on uh, environmental legislative priorities. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, in terms of size, is St. Mark's in Seattle. And at St. Mark's, it's very interesting. I have a friend there who's on the, the vestry, which is like, the, I guess, the equivalent of the council uh, in most churches. And um, the bishop for the archdiocese, they call it a you know, larger area, I guess it's like a regional synod, had long been very focused on this uh, issue. He had um, issued a call for creation care, and they developed a pledge that you could go online and make, and a, a tracking tool, much like the one we just looked at, that households could use. Nobody did anything for a long time. <laughs> it just didn't go anywhere, because there was no engagement in the congregations on this. It was top down. And by the way, the Presbyterian uh, Synod called for all their congregations to go carbon neutral, in 2006, 2006, they were way ahead of the game. They did they, completely everything we've talked about in 2019 here, 
they were talking about in 2006. But our home church is a Presbyterian congregation, and they're doing nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, it just is, and this is a, a common refrain amongst many um, uh, faith uh, organizations is that at the top, they're paying attention and talking about what needs to be done, and then at the bottom, they're not engaging. So, and I don't know quite what caused the change. I do know I had a, you know, my, my colleague is a bit of a rabble rouser, and he was in there trying to start a pot. <laughs> and we did some of the kinds of meetings that we're having today there. And their creation care team, they just kind of got, got a little bigger, a little more organized, and things started to happen. And now they're going full tilt at St. Mark's. They've developed a plan to eliminate the impact of their facilities. And that's a huge challenge for them. It's a very old building with very different kinds of technical challenges than you have here. Um, and they have a campus, they actually have multiple buildings. So uh, that's a big deal. And they hired an engineer to do a study for them um, that, that would uh, get them to that point. But then also as a congregation, they've adopted a net zero. So this is using offsets initiative. They want to be as a congregation. All the households that participate, uh, their members, uh, they want to be at net zero by 2030. And they already had started a program in the Philippines to care for a, um, a forest area in ways that would maximize the amount of carbon dioxide that's being stored and then they could sell offsets for that. Um, but now what they've done is they've gone further and established a fund and they're actually um, presenting their um, members of the congregation with an opportunity to contribute like you would do with an annual <coughs> pledge to a fund to offset their emissions. So these are kind of you know, two ends of the spectrum. And what I'd like to do now is just take, take some time at your tables to just talk about what St. Andrew's response should be. And what would that look like? And also, you know, take, take a pause to see are there any new insights or understandings that uh, come out of what we've talked about today that you would uh, bring to that thought process of figuring out how to respond at St. Andrews. Okay, so let's spend some time doing that. All right, thank you very much, everybody. I mean, I, I think you can see that there, uh, hopefully you can see there's a lot you can do as a community. There's all sorts of things, both looking at the facilities, but then also turning outward and looking at all the households that are represented in your congregation. Um, what I'd like to do is wrap up, because I know we, we don't have a lot of time here. Um, I want to wrap up with a, just a short um, talk about what we can do as citizens um, in the same line now, and then we'll be done for today. So the um, first thing I want to emphasize is that when you look at the national response to uh, global warming, the challenges are very different and very in different parts of the world. So if you look at, for example, the per capita emissions across the globe in 2017, they're just below six metric tons per person. Think those 30 foot in diameter spheres. In order to get our carbon emissions, our carbon footprint as a planet down 50% by 2030, which is what our best science tells us we need to accomplish to avert catastrophic levels of global warming. We need to be at about two, okay? Because we're adding people to the planet, so it's even more than it's more than 50% per capita, because there's more per capita. Um, now, if you look at where various countries are today, um, some of them, you know, India is a very poor nation overall. They, they're growing, their economy is growing rapidly, and they're using a lot more energy, but they might have an opportunity to skip the whole fossil fuel generation and go straight to solar uh, for a lot of their country. Uh, that's not necessarily a track they're on now, but it is the potential. Um, the EU is one, uh, this is about 20, I think this is the 28 nation collection in Europe. They've been coming down, and, but they've still got a ways to go too, because overall it's a fairly wealthy industrialized um, economy. China has been growing rapidly, and a lot of that growth and use of a lot of energy is making goods that are consumed by the rest of the world. Um, if you actually factor that into the equation, China's emissions for China are probably somewhere below six, below the average. The opposite is true of the United States. So if you just look at the energy we use in our in our within our borders, we're about 16 metric tons per person, but when you 
think about all the goods that we buy that come from other places uh, because there's so much manufacturing in other places that uh, manufactured goods that we bring into this country, we tend to export services. Um, it's more like 20. Uh, this is Union, union Concerned Scientist uh, analysis. So we have the longest way to go. But we also have the greatest resources of any nation on the planet. And um, as we talked about in the first session, in this region, it would cost about 1% of GDP to make this transition to not using fossil fuels in our economy. And that's similar to the levels that our country spent on the Iraq war, for example. So it's definitely achievable. And um, the one that I find very interesting is Sweden, because it's a northern country, um, it's pretty industrialized. They have a lot of, of uh, steel, for example, production there. And they, um, but they're very low, and the, the simple fact is they've just been working at it longer and more seriously than other countries. If you think back to that list, I wanted to see if anybody can remind me, what were the, the things we have to do to decarbonize our, our regional economy? Remember we made that list um, in the first session? I'm just going to put those back up here for session. They, they were... Um, Cutting waste of energy and electrifying or having clean electricity and then electrifying was the next next major category. Biofuels for the things that we can't electrify. And then we talked about materials, uh, cement in particular as an example, and lastly. Um, carbon sinks, natural carbon sinks, like our fields and forests. So those were the six things that we've got to, six sort of strategies we have to execute. And Sweden's pretty much done all of them. They're very efficient in their economy, far more efficient than we are per dollar of economic output. They use a lot less energy. Um, their grid is almost entirely clean. They haven't yet done much of this because uh, in their transportation sector, and that's why that's their biggest challenge right now is to reduce the transportation sector. They have a, they're at about 20% um, use of biofuels in transportation. Um, I don't I, can, I really don't know that they've thought much about the, uh, managing the um, impact of materials that come into their economy or that they produce in their economy. With the exception of one, they are they are. Um, scaling up processes to create steel in ways that don't produce any emissions. Uh, this is new technology. And then lastly, about 60%, I think, of the countryside is forest still. So um, they've done a lot to try and implement these strategies. And the most significant thing they did early on that hasn't been done anywhere else in the world is to put in place, put in place a price on um, emissions that um, would be noticed by households and businesses. Businesses and households had to uh, respond to this. It wasn't just a, t a price, for example, on large polluters, on factories. It was on households and businesses and how they use energy. So I want to do the same exercise briefly here for a moment with um, uh, our thinking our role as citizens. So I want to do the same exercise for a moment what are the things you can think of that you can do that take little time or money that uh, in your role as a citizen? Reduce the number of car trips. With no, um, not, not in your role as a household manager. Oh. Okay, different, different, different part, different persona for you. Not in your role as a member of this community, but in your role as a citizen. Uh, the city and uh, county and state and national government. Vote for political leaders who will support you. <laughs> yep, vote for change. Okay, just getting out to vote is really important. If you're in Bellevue, you could help pass the bond measure that is that is up right now because our schools were trying to make more energy efficient with that bond measure. Okay. So we're talking about voting at, uh, for school bond. What else? I think, you know, we start tripping down the road of some uh, 
political actions that may be uncomfortable for people to take in a, in a church setting, which I, I completely understand. But one thing is to listen and learn as a citizen. Um, if we feel uncomfortable, if we feel like our actions um, might not be, I don't know, the most impactful, we can listen and learn too as a citizen. Okay. That's really important. Other things. Encourage your uh, local businesses and city leaders to sort of, in, the, in any interaction you have, to you know make make small changes that can be even as simple as, hey, have you looked at the you know compostable silverware that you're using? Uh, I'm just going to put this in two categories. Vote with your wallet. <laughs> Right? You can tell, tell the businesses that you engage with that you would really like them to see, see them doing things. The implication is that I may not want to be your customer anymore if you don't make those kinds of changes. Um, the other one is more local um, interaction with, with uh, government. Because you can, you can go talk for three minutes at any city council meeting. You can just do it. Just go and sign up. You can talk about anything you want to talk about. They're there to, to listen to you. They work for you. I'm not sure how to put this, but um, every major city, for example, has a green building council. Okay, And if someone's planning to remodel their house, or you're part of an organization that's about to build a building, uh, you know, or, or even in the case of a bond or something, advocate for, for the use and application of those resources. Okay. Let's switch gears for a moment and talk about things that would take some investment. So either a lot of time or a lot of money. Greener I'm again thinking of citizens. So what was the, the question, the point here? Greener transportation or public transportation. Okay, so with your tax dollars, you can invest in um, transit. Other things. It's a little hard to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we can insist that we divest from fossil fuel organizations. You know, start as not in, not necessarily personally, but as as a larger community. That's hard. We have the initiative system in Washington State. It's not. It's certainly a significant time cost, but um, any any citizen can write an initiative. It's true. All right, I'm going to um, switch gears here for a moment and look at a list that I created that uh, I know from research is represents some of the most significant things we can do in our role as citizens. And um, I'm going to actually start with the one on the top on the left and talk about it. Doesn't take any time. There's so many people who aren't talking about climate change. You've seen it happen now in the Democratic race, and I actually credit our governor here with pushing those candidates to make climate change something that got talked about. In 2016, it was all never talked about. Now it's being talked about. Okay, so just talking about it with friends, family, uh, colleagues is one very important thing that we can all do. And I think it's so important that we're going to spend the entire next session talking about how we do that. Um, Talk about voting, that's excellent. Vote for climate champions. There are a bunch of things you can do that take very little time that have a huge impact. I don't really, I've never done this before, but for the last couple of years, calling your congressperson a couple times a year to let them know what it is that matters to you and, and ask them to do something about it. It's a very easy, quick, and pleasant experience because they want to hear from you. That they got voted into office because they're there to do something that matters to you. Um, so they want to know what matters to you. And if you contact them a couple times a year, it takes five minutes. Uh, you can use tools that, for example, Citizens Climate Lobby gives us that um, give us a, a couple, a script, a talking point, the phone numbers, and we're done. We just check a box and we know that the calls got made. Um, and it's very cordial. And at the end, they'll say thank you for. You know, sharing that, I'll relay your concern to the congressman or congresswoman. Um, the same thing goes for your state legislators. They 
typically only hear from lot paid lobbyists. That's who spend a lot of time with them. Um, or associations that represent fairly narrow business interests. They don't hear a lot from their, from their individual constituents. Um, your city council, as I mentioned a moment ago, is having meetings every month. You can drop in and talk about whatever's important to you. Um, and then nobody mentioned this, but donating even a small amount of money uh, takes a little bit of the money, but even a small amount of money, if it's done on uh, big enough scales, uh, matters a lot to nonprofits that are working in this area, and there are some that are doing very good work. So there is an awful lot we can do that I think many of us pre presently just aren't doing much of, that don't take a lot of time or money that have a real impact. Then there are the ones that do take time or money, and you can make major investments. You might even be thinking about, uh, depending on your, where you are in your life, about a bequest, for example. You can write um, nonprofit organizations into your will. Um, you can just decide to bring that forward and start contributing more, so you don't have anything left to give away at the end. Um, joining a, a team of people that are working on this problem, whether it's a creation care ministry team at your church or a climate action organization, that sets you up to do something that I know will really amplify your impact. If you go down with a group of people to talk to your legislator, it has a lot more impact than if you show up um, as individuals. Especially if you go down as part of one of these organizations like Citizens Climate Lobby that will help you, train you in how to be effective in having that conversation with a, a legislator about something that's important to you. So there is a lot we can do, um, and, and a lot of it involves just getting a little bit more engaged with our democracy than we are today uh, in a personal way so you actually get to know your legislators. Um, so I want to give you a chance to do something about that right now. <laughs> I'm going to pass it out a set of cards. Service. Yep. And I'm going to give you a couple cards, and you can just write your name on them. And if you want to have your congressperson support the um, uh, the bill that we talked about that would put a price on. Carbon pollution, you can do that here. Are these the same ones you had last week? Yes. Okay. Uh, we didn't collect them last week. We didn't get, we didn't get to do time to do that last week. So I'm going to give you one of those, and you can. Uh, it takes just a minute to fill out, and I will personally collect them and hand them back to your representative. As long as. All right, so next week, uh, Mark Holcomb is going to help me uh, talk with you about how we have productive conversations about the climate crisis with uh, people in our networks. Thank you. Thank you.